In this video, we discuss the deadly virtue of self-sacrifice. Duty ethics falsely claims that self-sacrifice out of love for others is the greatest of all virtues. The children's book called The Giving Tree has been described as one of the most divisive books in children's literature. The book has been met with criticism for the way in which it depicts the relationship between the boy and the tree. Some authors believe the book is not actually intended for children, but instead should be treated as a satire aimed at adults. Either way, The Giving Tree is an excellent example illustrating the deadly virtue of self-sacrifice. The following description summarizes the plot of the book. Once there was a tree, and she loved a little boy. He climbs up her trunk, swings from her branches, eats her apples, sleeps in her shade, and the boy loved the tree. But time went by, and the boy grew older. The tree asked the boy to come and play. The boy said, I am too big to play, but can you give me some money? The tree said, Take my apples, boy, and sell them in the city. Then you will have money and be happy. And the tree was happy. The boy stayed away for a long time, and the tree was sad. The boy came back and said, Can you give me a house? The tree said, You may cut off my branches and build a house. Then you will be happy. And the tree was happy. The boy stayed away for a long time. The boy came back and said, I am too old and sad to play. I want a boat that will take me far away from here. The tree said, Cut down my trunk and make a boat. And so the boy cut down her trunk and sailed away, and the tree was happy. And after a long time, the boy came back again. I don't need much now, said the boy, just a quiet place to sit and rest. The tree said, Come, boy, sit down and rest. And the boy did. And the tree was happy. The end. Happy ending, right? But wait, like all people who push false ideals, they cheat and stop before the true logical conclusion. The tree actually can still give more. So here's the story with a properly consistent ending. The stump still had more to give. The boy got cold, but had a wood-burning stove. So he ground the stump into pellets, and the wood pellets were happy. And when winter came, the boy burned the pellets. Finally, the tree had nothing more to give, so its days of happiness were over. As to all things that consistently live a destructive philosophy of self-sacrifice, the tree no longer existed. Really the end. Because there is an infinite supply of people out there to give to, it doesn't matter much how much you give. You can always give more, and it's never enough. The Giving Tree summarizes historical Christianity's false notion of Christ-like love being self-sacrificial. John 15:13, which says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends, is a common stumbling block scripture used by historical Christianity to promote self-sacrifice. In other words, for duty ethics, it is not the achievement and attainment of values, but rather the sacrifice of values that is the hallmark of a true saint. Anders Nygren said, What then has the cross of Christ to tell us about the nature and content of agape love? It testifies that it is a love that gives itself away, that sacrifices itself, even to the uttermost. Indeed, as Paul sees it, agape can go so far in requiring a man to sacrifice his own spiritual advantages for the advantage of his neighbor, that he even declares himself willing to be accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of his kinsmen, according to the flesh, if thereby they might be saved. Much of historical Christianity takes this scripture to the ultimate possible conclusion, to promote the false notion that Christ's love was self-sacrificial in not just a mortal life sense, but also in an eternal life sense. Mother Teresa said, If my separation from you, Jesus, brings others to you, and in their love and company you find joy and pleasure, why, Jesus, I am willing with all my heart to suffer all that I suffer, not only now, but for all eternity, if this was possible. In other words, the ultimate duty ethics required of historical Christianity is to ruin yourself, give up your eternal spiritual advantages, and be cut off from eternal life, all for the sake of others. Good luck with that. Satan must be showing the most self-sacrificial love then, losing his eternal life in order to provide temptations for the rest of us. What do you think Brigham Young had to say on this subject? He said, Some have gone so far as to say that a man or woman who wishes to be saved in the kingdom of God, who wishes to be a servant or handmaid of the Almighty, must feel that deep contrition of heart, that sound repentance, and such a sense of his or her unworthiness and nothingness, and of the supremacy, glory, and exaltation of that deity they believe in, as to exclaim before God and their brethren and sisters that they are willing to be damned. 
To me, that is one of the heights of nonsense. For if a person is willing to be damned, he cares not to make the efforts necessary to secure salvation. Brigham Young also said, God, our Heavenly Father, in His religion, does not require men and women to suffer as false religions do. Take the religions of the heathen and the false systems of religion generally, and they require sacrifices that the Lord does not require. He said, The saints sacrifice everything, but strictly speaking, there is no self-sacrifice about it. If you give a penny for a million of gold, a handful of earth for a planet, a temporary worn-out tenement for one glorified, that will exist, abide, and continue to increase throughout a never-ending eternity, what a self-sacrifice for sure. But don't we believe in sacrifice? Yes, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ believes in the law of sacrifice, not the law of self-sacrifice. Elder Uchtdorf said, An acceptable sacrifice is when we give up something good for something of far greater worth. President Brigham Young said, You hear much said by some about their sacrifices. As they use the term, it is without meaning to me. Where then is the self-sacrifice this people have ever made? There is no such thing. They have only exchanged a worse condition for a better one. He also said, You hear many talk about having made sacrifices. If I had that word, self-sacrifice, in my vocabulary, I would blot it out. But don't we believe in sacrifice? Yes, the restored gospel of Jesus Christ believes in the law of sacrifice, not the law of self-sacrifice. The law of sacrifice is life-beneficial and laden with values. It means giving up a lesser value to gain a greater value, or trading up. Self-sacrifice is exactly as the word says, self-destructive and duty-laden, meaning you must do it no matter what you think about it or how it affects you. It means giving up a greater value to gain a lesser value. In the game of chess, sacrifice means giving up a piece of lesser value, such as a pawn, in order to capture a piece of greater value, such as a queen. Imagine playing chess from a self-sacrifice perspective. The game would be over in a hurry with the self-destruction of the self-sacrificer. Likewise, in real life, the self is the greatest value anyone has. Consequently, any sacrifice of self is by definition self-destructive. So what about war? Is war an example of self-sacrifice for country? In Alma 46.12 it says, And it came to pass that he, Captain Moroni, rent his coat, and he took a piece thereof and wrote upon it, In memory of our God, our religion, and freedom, and our peace, our wives, and our children. And he fastened it upon the end of a pole. Notice that Captain Moroni didn't make an altruistic duty ethics appeal. He reminded his people of all the values they needed to protect in order to maintain the good life they had achieved. Can you imagine the people's response to Captain Moroni if he had ripped his coat and wrote on it, Self-sacrifice yourself with no thought of reward. Give up your life whether it does any good or not because it's your duty. The story would have turned out very differently because few people would have followed him. The gospel target is the law of sacrifice, which is calculated self-progression or trading up. What would undershooting the mark be? That would be self-indulgence or unrestrained self-gratification, ruining yourself by giving in to every destructive bodily appetite. What would overshooting the mark be? That would be self-sacrifice or unrestrained self-desertion, destructively giving away all things to others that you need to further your own life and progression. In the end, with either undershooting or overshooting, you are dead. The self that was once you is destroyed. What about Christ? Did he self-sacrifice himself for us? A more exact question to ask, is he better off or worse off for his atonement? A simple topical guide study on the word glory will answer that question. In Moses 1.39 it says, For behold, this is my work and my glory, to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. In 2 Peter 1.17 it says, For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. 1 Timothy 3.16 says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Alma 26.16 says, Therefore let us glory, yea, we will glory in the Lord, yea, we will rejoice, for our joy is full, yea, we will praise our God forever. 
Behold, who can glory too much in the Lord? Yea, who can say too much of his great power and of his mercy and of his long suffering toward the children of men? In 1 Peter 5.11 it says, To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. If Christ hadn't done the atonement, would he be receiving dominion over all of us and glory? If the story of Christ ended with the cross, then it would indeed be a story about self-sacrifice. However, Christ's sacrifice is only but an introduction to the eternal nature of his gospel. And all of the descriptions of the glory he personally received clearly show that he is better off because of his atonement, and that it was not done out of self-destructive self-sacrifice. What about us? What do you and I get out of it? Are we self-sacrificing in becoming followers of Christ? Again, a topical guide study on the word glory answers that question. In Doctrine and Covenants 6.30 it says, And even if they do unto you, even as they have done unto me, blessed are ye, for you shall dwell with me in glory. In Colossians 3.4 it says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Psalms 84.11 says, The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. 1 Peter 5.4 says, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Doctrine and Covenants 75.5 says, And thus, if ye are faithful, ye shall be laden with many sheaves, and crowned with honor and glory and immortality and eternal life. Doctrine and Covenants 58.3 says, Ye cannot behold with your natural eyes for the present time the design of your God concerning those things which shall come hereafter, and the glory which shall follow after much tribulation. Doctrine and Covenants 76.55-56 says, They are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. They are they who are priests and kings, who have received of his fullness and of his glory. Doctrine and Covenants 88.107 says, And then shall the angels be crowned with the glory of his might, and the saints shall be filled with his glory, and receive their inheritance and be made equal with him. Doctrine and Covenants 130 verse 2 says, And that same sociality which exists among us here, will exist among us there, only it will be coupled with eternal glory, which glory we do not now enjoy. Notice the final state as priests and kings, not slaves or beggars. The end goal of self-sacrifice is a stump for other people to sit on, pellets to be burned, a life to be destroyed. Clearly, our participation in following Christ is not altruistic self-sacrifice. It is about securing for ourselves eternal glory. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to the Christian Eternalism YouTube channel and visit www.christianeternalism.org.